Again, my name is Roger Worthington. I use he, him, his pronouns. And as the executive director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education, I am honored to help sponsor and to host the ACPA Presidential Symposium at UMD and to welcome you all today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this esteemed panel uh, of colleagues as part of uh, this program today. Uh, I very much appreciate the invitation from the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington uh, to speak about the student personnel point of view uh, from a racial and social justice lens. Most of my work over the course of my career in academia, which has not spanned the um, half of the 70 years, uh, but close, <laughs> um, has been framed through the lens of diversity and inclusion. Uh, I was trained as a counseling psychologist, and my work in my own discipline was centered on multicultural counseling, sexual identity development, uh, difficult dialogues, teaching, and learning. Uh, when I moved from my first academic job at Boston College to the University of Missouri, where I spent the bulk of my career before coming here, I encountered a group of staff, student affairs staff, student affairs staff at Mizzou who wanted to conduct a campus climate study. Now, the context for that was that the system of the University of Missouri, the system president had removed the term sexual orientation from the non-discrimination clause for the university system. Removed it. It was there, and he removed it. And he did so for political reasons. And you know, there, are, um, there were a group of staff on the campus who wanted to find a way to in, instill the rationale in the administration to reinsert sexual orientation back into the non-discrimination clause. But they had a fear of retaliation, and that fear was real. They had a lack of of academic freedom, which is accorded only to tenured faculty, technically, in institutions of higher education. And as a newly appointed assistant professor, I said, oh, I'll help you. <laughs> which, yeah, it's, it's kind of comical in that sense, because, uh, you know, newly appointed assistant professors may also technically have academic freedom. You also have a bit of chance at retaliation as well. But it worked, and we were successful. In 2003, the University of Missouri system, in part on the basis of the campus climate work that we did together in that institution, reinserted sexual orientation back into the non-discrimination clause for that institution. And from that point on, the majority of my work uh, has been in the space of diversity in higher education. Um, my bio is out there uh, in, you know, on the website and, and that sort of thing. I won't cover all of those things. Um, uh, I've served as a CDO for two different institutions at the University of Missouri and then as an interim CDO here for uh, the last year. Um, now back to uh, professor and executive director of the center. But the student personnel point of view. I'd never really read it before actually being invited to take part in this program. Uh, I'm a counseling psychologist by training. Um, and so although a lot of my work has been in this space, um, I had never read this document. Um, and some of the themes that I noticed in this document include things like student agency instilling a sense of agency in our students, self-determination, the ability to um, direct their own course in life through the education that we provide in our institutions. 
There's an interesting theme of preparation for a heteronormative life. It's true. Marriage. Heterosexual marriage. Um, there is a clear, undeniable, white racial frame in this document. Much like the Constitution of the United States or the Declaration of Independence, using he and him pronouns and uh, presuming that we all belong to the same homogenous white racial frame. There's no real recognition of diversity except at some level of a deficit model related to cognitive differences and the need for assessment related to person environment fit, which we now would conceptualize more accurately as person environment interaction, if that makes sense. So as, a, as psychologists, we were very much participants in the time of that assessment for engaging in helping institutions identify students who, in the words of Kronbach, would fit as they are into our institutions of higher education. Person environment fit. So let's talk a little bit about today's day and age. It's the 70th anniversary of the student personnel point of view and who knew that 70 years ago this document in some ways would remain actually very relevant to higher education contexts in the 21st century. In some ways, this document was actually pretty progressive for its time. Yet, here we are in 2019, and who knew we would be confronted with the truly frightening context we live in today? The Anti-Defamation League reported just this past year that white supremacist propaganda increased 77% from 17 to 18, targeting 287 campuses in 47 states. Now, this propaganda often includes elements of recruitment, and hate groups seek to inspire vulnerable college students to act out their agenda, much like you would hear on cable news are the tactics of ISIS. These kinds of acts take the form of postings, of flyers, chalkings, graffiti, hate speech, public events, nooses, violence, and even murder. These acts of hate can come from off campus or they can be perpetuated by members of our own campus communities. In some instances, faculty, faculty are the perpetrators of biased teaching methods portrayed as originalism teaching the unfiltered, unquestioned, racist works of decades or centuries past. Students oftentimes simply remain silent, even when they know the, the identity of some perpetrators. We have a pervasiveness of bystander apathy on our campuses and in our residence halls and in our classrooms. Campus administrators collude oftentimes to seek to reduce negative publicity when these acts occur, and campus communities often exist within a shroud of secrecy. I'm not going to mince words here. We have failed. We have failed in our efforts. We live in a time of government-sanctioned hate. Government-sanctioned anti-immigrant hate 
government-sanctioned anti-black racism, government-sanctioned anti-indigenous racism, inviting high school students to the White House who harassed indigenous people on the mall, government-sanctioned rape culture and misogyny, government-sanctioned trans marginalization just last week in the Supreme Court, government-sanctioned anti-Semitism and government-sanctioned Islamophobia and government-sanctioned environmental tyranny. And these hate groups that come to our campuses and target us as soft targets, efforts to recruit and publicize their ideology and their rhetoric, shroud themselves in the First Amendment and claims of freedom of speech. In 2014, there was a mass shooting in my doctoral granting institution, the University of California, Santa Barbara. And Elliot Roger, who was the shooter in that incident, was described as the first alt-right inspired murderer when he killed six people and then himself. Wei Han David Wong, Cheng Yun James Hong, George Chen, <coughs> Veronica Weiss, Catherine Cooper, Christopher Michaels Martinez. In 2017, on our own campus, there was a murder of a young man who was visiting here from Bowie State, two days away from his own graduation, recently commissioned as second lieutenant Richard Collins III. And then later that same year in Charlottesville, Heather Heyer was run down during the alt-right rally there. We have significant challenges on our campuses. There is truly a new normal. And Campuses in the past couple of years have scrambled to find ways to respond to the targeting of higher education by hate groups with white supremacist propaganda. And what you see here is this policy tension between freedom of speech and expression and academic freedom founded in our institutional missions against the unprotected conduct of incitement, threats, intimidation, and challenges to physical safety. And when institutions across the country in the past two years scrambled to pull together committees to address these challenges, they focused primarily on these issues. For many, the focus was a reflection of inept and tone-deaf rhetoric about the fundamental mission of higher education around free speech and academic freedom with absolutist positions based in legal theories about restrictions on time, place, and manner, incitement, threats, and intimidation, and only in the wake of recent murders, challenges to physical safety. More recently, national higher education associations have drawn the focus back to critical issues of justice, equity, inclusion, non-discrimination, and campus climate. In many ways, people across higher education view these issues as in conflict in opposition or in tension. And 
they do not need to be. We need to frame our mission as higher education institutions as justice focused to correct the mistakes of the past. The way to do this is, in my view, through anti-racism, which is an active form of transformational institutional change designed to alter the way an institution does business by fundamentally changing long-standing policies, procedures, practices, standards that overtly or covertly contribute to and maintain racial hierarchies, inequities, and injustices. An anti-racist institution addresses threats to racial justice by critically examining standard operating procedures, policies, assumptions, beliefs, values, and its underlying historical context. Anti-racism is not confined solely to issues on the dimension of race. Instead, the foundational lens of racial justice provides the critical framework from which issues of intersectionality coalesce with marginalizing oppressions based on multiple identities can be deconstructed and disentangled from institutional organizational structures and policies. It's not easy to do that. Most of our institutions, the vast majority, were based, founded as whites only, men's only institutions. And our foundations and the policies that have been constructed within our institutions perpetuate the white racial frame. The same white racial frame that claims that Europeans discovered the Americas. Or that race is a biological reality. But not racism. So becoming an anti-racist institution requires each unit of the college or university to clarify its objectives, identify gaps, confront obstacles, and develop strategies for achieving its goals, as well as to monitor and evaluate its progress toward meeting those objectives. Accountability, metrics, data, At the very entry level of anti-racism work, recruitment of a diverse student body or a diverse faculty or a diverse staff is an oversimplified way of thinking about and understanding the work of diversity and inclusion in higher education. These efforts of recruitment cannot be separated from essential efforts of retention, which brings into focus the critical impacts of campus climate, curriculum and instruction, research and inquiry, intergroup relations and discourse, student, faculty, staff, achievement and success, leadership development, non-discrimination, institutional advancement, external relations, all of it. Strategic planning and accountability. All of which must be addressed across a multitude of intersecting social identity characteristics and focal groups. We have to think about anti-racism in relation to 
the concepts that we oftentimes bring to the table when we talk about diversity and inclusion. So often people think being non-racist is sufficient. And what is the difference between non-racist and anti-racist? What is the difference between non-racist and anti-racist? Well, being a non-racist is simply just a claim for identity. I don't think of myself as racist. Good enough. End of story. But anti-racism requires action. Anti-racism requires definitive, forward-thinking, progressive action to dismantle injustice in our institutions. So it's not enough to call yourself a non-racist and to do this work. It's, it's sort of like saying I'm woke in some ways. I can come to my, the university and say I'm woke. I understand. I know the realities of racism and sexism and homophobia, heteronormativity, trans marginalization, and you can be woke without really being forced to do a thing. So let's do some things. Let's work toward equity, diversity, and inclusion. Sure, most of the time, as you know, a former CDO, as a as an expert in diversity and inclusion in higher education, people think that I'm going to talk about diversity. That means I can count, and indeed, I can. I have a PhD. I I can count. But I can do more than count. Compositional diversity is not enough. And the frame of our work around compositional diversity holds us back. Inclusion oftentimes brings us to this notion that we are allowing the less privileged people into our institutions. And in the essence of trying to portray inclusion, we exemplify non-inclusion in our language and in our actions. Justice is the true path. Righting what is wrong. Taking our institutions through institutional transformational change. That's the answer. And that's where we need to go. Thank you for your time.